Today, we'll be picking back up in our journey through the book of Acts. But since it's been several months since we last studied Luke's amazing account of the things God was doing in the New Covenant Church, we'll begin with a review of where we last left off. In chapter 2, when Pentecost was celebrated, the Holy Spirit fell on the followers of Jesus, and after Peter's sermon, those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And Luke tells us that these new disciples continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So in Jerusalem, during and after Pentecost, there were many devout people present. And after an initial group of around 3,000 were baptized and added to the church, daily more and more people were also repenting and being saved. So baptism was how a convert identified as a disciple of Jesus, as Luke mentions. And after they became a disciple, then they continued in the apostles' teaching and in fellowship with prayers. And in chapter 2, Luke reveals the love and the unity that these followers of the Messiah were expressing by saying, Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. Then in chapter 3, after God healed a lame man through Peter and John, we see Peter preaching the gospel again to the crowd at the temple. And then chapter 4 begins with the religious leaders trying to intimidate the apostles while they stood firm in the faith. And after being released and joining together in prayer to God for boldness and attesting miracles, the building they were meeting in shook and they were given a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit so that they could preach the word boldly. And later in chapter 4, Luke highlights again how the Spirit-filled church in Jerusalem was miraculously unified and generous, as Luke writes. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need." So we see that they clearly took the words of our Lord Jesus Christ literally when he instructed, Do not seek what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And after we saw how all the disciples of Jesus demonstrated the Messiah's teachings literally, we learned about one particular man we know as Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. But then, just after Luke described the obedient, loving charity of the disciples in Acts and even the specific actions of the man we know as Barnabas, we learned that Luke intentionally contrasted those righteous actions with the deceitful actions of one particular couple in the church. We saw that just after the description of Barnabas and the other followers of Christ generously selling their excess possessions to help their brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, then Luke describes Ananias and his wife Sapphira intentionally lying to the church, the Apostle Peter, and most importantly, lying to the Holy Spirit all in order to appear more giving and more generous than they really were. And we should also note, based on all that Luke has written so far in Acts, for Ananias and Sapphira to be part of the church in Jerusalem, they must have been baptized to be added to the number of the disciples. This would have been the case, since we know that Jesus plainly commanded that they go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And we also know that Peter told the crowds to repent and be baptized in his preaching too. But, even though Ananias and Sapphira were part of the church, Luke records, But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then... Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. So in context, we can see that Ananias and Sapphira were acting as if they were giving all of the proceeds of the sale of their land, while really holding some of the money back for themselves. And as Peter clearly explained, the land was their own. They could have kept the land or even sold it and given part of the proceeds. But instead, they sinned against God by pretending to give all of the proceeds while only giving some. It is obvious that they were being what the Bible calls hypocrites, which simply means an actor and they conspired together to lie to the congregation so that they could pretend to be as generous as the other folks in the assembly like Barnabas. To other people who thought in this same way, Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, 
for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And even though they claim to be followers of Jesus, Ananias and Sapphira were being just like the scribes and the Pharisees, because they thought they could get away with appearing outwardly righteous to men, while inside they were plotting to lie just to make themselves appear better than they really were. So, to prevent any of his disciples from falling into the trap of pretending to follow him while continuing to live in intentional sin, Jesus warned his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, Whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Jesus made it clear that no one can get away with hypocrisy, because all of the secret sins that people try to hide, and even all of their attempts to appear righteous without actually repenting and turning to Jesus to receive a truly pure heart, will be exposed one day before many witnesses. The evil words that they have whispered in secret will be heard by all. So instead of worrying about what others think of us, we should instead repent of all wicked acts and instead be concerned of what the Almighty, who has the power to cast people into hell, thinks of us. But sadly, instead of fearing God, while understanding that the Creator sees all things, including our deepest motivations, Ananias and Sapphira practiced self-promotional lying to try to impress the congregation in Jerusalem. And in this case, their secret was revealed on the spot by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see later that their immediate judgment had the intended effect on the rest of the church. But not all hypocrites will be exposed immediately, because Jesus also explained, But I say to you, that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And because this day of judgment is coming, Paul includes himself as he writes, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Now, we know Ananias and Sapphira didn't yet have the book of Romans. And perhaps they didn't remember the words of their Lord Jesus Christ, but they still had no excuse because they also could have looked to the words of Solomon who wrote, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. God has always clearly explained that we must fear Him and keep His commandments because He will judge every single action, including every secret action, together with every good and evil secret. So through the Bible, everyone has been warned very clearly that there are no secrets that can be hidden from God. 
and along with Ananias and his wife, no one has an excuse. Their lie was not hidden from God, and he had already warned them by saying, These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. So they intentionally conspired to lie, even while in these and many other passages, God mercifully warned Ananias and his wife not to break his commandments by lying. And because they did not heed the many warnings of Scripture, they became an example to all who would practice hypocrisy in the future. Truly, Ananias and his wife Sapphira serve as a clear new covenant warning to all who would follow in their foolish footsteps by thinking that they could keep a secret from God. But sadly, from countless unrepentant sinners, I have heard this particular mistake repeated over and over again because they've been deceived themselves with a false gospel. And this most dangerous mistake is that God cannot see their ongoing sin. They claim that simply by saying a prayer or believing an approved set of facts about Jesus, they can go on living in their sinful rebellion against God's law without ever repenting. And then they add to that heresy by saying that the eternal, all-knowing, all-seeing God of the universe can't see their continual sin any longer. Well, not only does the biblical account of Ananias and his wife immediately disprove that idea, there are scores of passages and examples that directly contradict it, such as Romans 2.16 that warns God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So once again, we are warned that there are no secrets before God and everything hidden will be revealed. And Paul also warns, Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. While the writer of Hebrews explains clearly, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Even the ancient hymnal of the faithful to God, the Psalms record, If we had forgotten the name of our God, or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would God not search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. And the Creator explains, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And the Almighty adds, Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth? says the Lord. Truly, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So the modern heresy that God cannot see the ongoing sin of a person who has said a prayer or believes certain facts about the Messiah is absolutely unbiblical, and there are many, many more verses to bear this fact out. For example, in the last book of all of God's Word, our eternally glorified Messiah said, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, 
I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. It is impossible to miss the biblical reality that Jesus can see the sins of his church, and he warns that after he judged Thyatira, all the churches shall know that Jesus is the one who searches the minds and hearts, and he will give to each person according to their works. In fact, Jesus told each of the seven churches one common phrase in those seven letters, and that phrase was, I know your works. Chapter 2 and 3 of the Revelation reveal that if the church was doing anything wrong, Jesus Christ saw it and rebuked them for it. The Messiah even explained, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. How can Jesus see a Christian's works and even rebuke them for their sins if he can't see their ongoing sin? Obviously, as Scripture says over and over again, God can see our sins. And Jesus plainly says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. The truth is that Paul has explained the forgiveness we have in Jesus Christ by writing, in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed. This very plain verse explains what occurs for each and every person who repents and calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And this verse makes it clear that at the moment of repentance, God passes over our previous sins and they are washed away in the blood of the Messiah so that we can enter into covenant with God. And this is just how the blood of the Passover lamb allowed God to pass over the previously committed sins of Israel that night. And Israel was redeemed by the blood so that they could enter covenant with God. But some of those same people later died in the wilderness for their sin. And Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is a warning to us in the new covenant. And the writer of Hebrews includes themselves in the following warning as they write, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And this is the consistent witness of both covenants. 
In Leviticus, there is no sacrifice for intentional sin. And in the New Covenant, if we willfully sin after receiving a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Friends, this is exactly what Ananias and his wife did. They plotted and conspired together to intentionally lie. And in doing so, they trampled the Son of God underfoot. They counted the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified by as a common thing. And they insulted the Spirit of grace. And this truth is found in the same letter that many false teachers now quote out of context to try to lead more people into the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. Since one particular verse says, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. They will tell you that this means that you're already forgiven in the past tense for all of your sins, past, present, and future. And therefore, God can no longer see your sins. But they've ignored hundreds of other passages, as we've already seen. And even worse, they've taken this passage out of its context. Hebrews is actually comparing the sacrificial system and the priests of the first covenant to the new covenant. And the writer explains, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every high priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So in context, the way to understand the passage correctly is to see that the comparison was between the repeated sacrifices of the Levitical covenant compared to the once-for-all-time sacrifice of Jesus Christ in the New Covenant. The words once-for-all are referencing how many times Jesus made his sacrifice, not how they apply to an individual disciple. And this is basic Bible hermeneutics. So any teacher who knowingly twists this passage should be ashamed of themselves. The sacrifice of the Messiah only occurred once in history. And actually, the Levitical sacrifices for sin were made so that we could understand the importance of Calvary and the blood of our Savior. And for those who intentionally go on living in sin after receiving a knowledge of the truth, in either the Levitical Covenant or the New Covenant, the same rule applies. There is no longer a sacrifice for their sins. Now, for those who unintentionally stumble, the Word of God explains graciously that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But this same book of the Bible also warns, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So this was why God judged Ananias and Sapphira that day, to show the church that his strong stand against intentional sin had not changed at the cross. Plus, he can still see the sins of his people, and they will be judged impartially. And this judgment had its intended effect. Because Luke ends this account by saying, So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And Jesus had the same intention when he judged Thyatira. And we know this because he said, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. 
The Messiah warned over and over again that we must all remember to fear the Lord because that's the very beginning of wisdom. And we must never ever think that our King cannot search our minds and hearts or that He doesn't intend to repay each one of us according to our actions. Forgetting the fear of the Lord by thinking that God cannot see ongoing rebellion against His commandments is a foolish and deadly path. And it was the fatal error of Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. So, to help us see that God still searches the minds and hearts of all men, and His mercy is on those who fear Him from generation to generation, God generously gave us the example of Ananias and his wife, dead on the floor, so that we would never forget to fear Him and keep His commandments. And truly, as Peter learned, God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him.